somebody thinks they've got away with murder. Police think Lisa Govan is dead. We all love you very, very much and want you back. A true crime investigation. Lisa Govan did not leave the club to her clubhouse. It was the Wild West. It was bad people and really bad people. They won war, well they got one. There were shootings out in the street, there were drive-by shootings. I was a bad man. It was a serious crime homicide. We've never seen this before. When there's blood in the water, in they come. The search for Lisa intensified. It's about a young girl who was missing. What do you care about that slut for? She's got to be out here somewhere. Do you know how Lisa Gunn died? Yes, I do. Kalgoorlie, the heart of Australia's greatest gold rush. Hoping to find some gold. Well, it would be nice. It would be a bonus. <laughs> Soon as though we never actually found any. In the red dirt of WA's gold fields, Ian and Pat Govan are searching. Ian would usually use the uh, metal detector, and we thought he'd found something that he would put across on the ground. I'd do the um, pinpointer <laughs> and then I'd do the digging. But gold isn't the only thing they're digging for. Six hundred kilometres from the nearest city, in the middle of the very harsh outback, Kalgoorlie may as well be on another planet. But it's been drawing people here since the early 1890s when Paddy Hannon first discovered gold. 100 years later, in the 1990s, people were still coming and they were still getting rich. But for all its promises, Kalgoorlie had a darker side, an underbelly that thrived in the isolation of the WA outback. Earlier, Lisa had been drinking with friends at a Kalgoorlie nightclub. Now police think Lisa Govan is dead. It's one of WA's great crime mysteries. What happened to Lisa Govan? Missing, presumed dead. 21 years on, still no body, still no arrests. And for her parents, no escaping the past. Well, we're very frightened. We're very worried. Oh, what more can you say? Can you appreciate the family's frustrations over the last 20 years? Absolutely, absolutely. Um, it's been a long time for them not having answers. We sort of got excited about Australia because Pat's parents were here, Pat's sister was here with her children. So we just upped and left and that was it. The family migrated to Perth from Lancashire in the UK with their four daughters, Sharon, Jacqueline, Lisa and Jeanette. In particular, 16-year-old Lisa adapted quickly to her new life in Perth. She enjoyed it. She, she was trying to talk Australian to be like everybody else, which upon trying to talk Australian, it just doesn't go. But she just wanted to belong and, you know, be Australian. Be accepted. And be accepted, yeah. yeah. Well, she was a few years older than me, so when she got her driver's license, she was so happy just to be out driving, so she'd take me places. We'd go to the beach together, we went to the movies. We'd just go out, she would be happy just to drive me to school. You can't do that, me and me! She was a happy-go-lucky girl. She enjoyed life. She, re she really did. She got caught out in a pub, underage, <laughs> which didn't surprise us. She would be easily egged on if her friends were all over 18 and she yeah. was 17. And her friends said, come on, you'll be all right. She would be there in a flash. In her early 20s, Lisa embarked on another adventure, this time with her new boyfriend, Tim Hamill. They'd been going together a while, and then she said she was going to go to Kalgoorlie. Well, I didn't want to go in that far. I mean, you know, I'm a little girl. So I tried to talk her out of it, but she said, no, we've got to go because of Tim's work. There was nothing here for him to do. 
You can come to Kalgoorlie with no money, no work and nowhere to live. Go to a pub and by the time you come out, you've got somewhere to live, you've got a job and you've got food on the table. And that's very unusual. Ashok Parekh arrived in the 1980s as a chartered accountant. He quickly realised the real money was in pubs. And the skimpier the clothes, the bigger the take. I think it was very vibrant. We had a lot of pubs around the place, very popular pubs. Um, I was involved in Sylvester's Nightclub, and I used to be called Harry's Upstairs. And there was very good pubs like the Foundry Hotel, the Star and Garner Hotel, John's Pub, which was Kalgoorlie, the Exchange Hotel, the Palace. It was very vibrant with a lot of people in there having a good time. It was a buzz of a place. It was like full on. We've been a few times and yeah. enjoyed it, haven't we? Yeah. I moved to Kalgoorlie in 1990 because my partner at the time got a job in mining, which is, you know, the way I think a lot of people end up in Kalgoorlie. Labor member for Kalgoorlie, Megan Anwell. <laughs> Megan Anwell was the surprise winner of the seat of Kalgoorlie in 1996. Politics was a tough game, even for a former criminal barrister. Being a champion for women, even tougher. A group of young West Australian School of Mines female students came to see me and they asked me would I be able to, was there some legal way that we could talk to the people that ran the annual Kalgoorlie Mining Expo and maybe get them to stop having naked women wandering around. Well, you've got to remember that Kalgoorlie was the quintessential Wild West outback town. Dusty, dirty, bikies, cops, FIFO, big open pubs, miners that were quick with their fists. It was a wild outback town. Veteran journalist Tony Barris built his career on bikies, old school cops and big business. Kalgoorlie had it all. But the reality is, is that you, you, you're coming into town, you're hot, you're tired, you're buggy, and you want to drink. And uh, you go into those fantastic old pubs that were built 150 years ago. Behind the bar, there's skimpies. They're selling you a cold beer. You can drink until your heart's content. You've got brothels that you can go to. You don't have to tiptoe around. You know, it's a man's paradise. A party town with the rumble of Harley Davidsons in the background. At that period, the bikies were really starting to emerge as a criminal force. They weren't just boats riding around having a bit of fun on Sunday. They were starting to become organised. Oh, well, I haven't had anything to do with bikies. They used to come here as clients, but as I understood it, a bikie makes a wonderful friend and a terrible enemy. Cuesta Casa is one of the oldest brothels in Kalgoorlie. Madame Carmel bought the business, known locally as the Pink House, in the early 1990s. It was the Wild West. Everybody drank like a fish and smoked like a chimney. Men and women both. The men were very macho and the women loved it. Everybody was friendly. When I arrived here, I discovered that the madams were well regarded in the town, probably because they were part of containment. In the 1990s, Kalgoorlie's infamous Hay Street was lined with brothels. The sex trade operated under a so-called containment policy, an unofficial law enforced by the coppers. Containment was what kept all the girls in the street. The town loved it for that reason. And the girls loved it because they knew that when they came here, they made big money. The containment policy was allowed in a town, in a state, that did not allow prostitution. That is always going to be the catalyst for corruption. Did you ever witness any police corruption firsthand? None. I've never had anything but very good relations with the police. But when I first came here, they did say to me, don't try and make friends with the other madams. Remember, you're all in competition. And they said, just keep your head down. And I did and I found it was very good advice. 
I just got an impression that people in positions of power, so maybe that would include police or whatever, that there was a sort of an assumption around that if you were a young woman, there was every chance that you were working as a skimpy barmaid or down at Hay Street. Um, I myself suffered this. I was quite shocked after I got elected to find out a lot of um, people thought I had worked as a skimpy barmaid in town. I'd actually been a lawyer. I mean, it just didn't make any sense to me. In a town famous for objectifying women, it took a long time for the case of a missing party girl to gain traction. Lisa, I didn't really know very well, but I'd been introduced to her at least one bar, I think several times, just out having a drink. And I just remember her because she was smiley, chatty, uh, she was an attractive young woman. The last known sighting of 28-year-old Lisa Govan was outside the Club Dero's bikey gang headquarters in Kalgoorlie. Do you think your sister made friends too easily? She would have done. She was so lovely. Everybody says how happy she was. She was bubbly. She was, she was great fun to be around, so definitely. I was really distressed to be told by some journalists that in one case that, that a police officer they'd inquired of doing their job as a journalist, they'd been told, what do you care about that slut for? I mean, that is just outrageous and I couldn't make these things up if I tried. Kalgoorlie police say if Lisa's not found soon, they'll intensify their investigation. I'd asked to speak to the um, inspector in charge of the police station. He was never there, or he was on holiday, or he was sick, or he's in a meeting, oh, and he would never call back. On the eve of what would have been Lisa Govan's 50th birthday, while her parents fossick in the red dust of the goldfields, a police cold case squad is doing its own digging, unearthing secrets of Kalgoorlie's past. Do you know how Lisa Govan died? Yes, I do. 